I'm going to be talking about words, how they work, and how we can teach in a way, excuse me, <clears throat> that supports the reading of complex text. Now, when we look at complex texts, and these are some of the texts that the folks on the Common Core uh, panel identified as exemplifying complex narrative on the left-hand side and informational on the right-hand side um, at grades four and five. I don't know what's happened there. Okay. So when we look at these texts, um, we see the words in purple as words that aren't the commonest words that you'd see. We see that there's some differences in the way in which the words in the informational text on the right act relative to the words on the left-hand side. So you see erupt, erupted, um, eruption um, in the, on the right-hand side. And you see a lot of different words on the right-hand side. And I'm really looking at the words in purple. We'll talk a little bit <clears throat> about purple and yellow words. The words in yellow are ones that are more common. So to be able to read complex text, yes, sentences do get longer as texts get harder. But the really critical thing is if you're still trying to figure out the words, it's going to be really difficult no matter how long the sentences are. <clears throat> so today, I want to talk about some of the things that we've learned about words over the last especially last few years, as the digitization of text has meant that linguists and educators have been able to study how words work in different kinds of text in ways that they weren't able to in the past. Now, we'll remember that English has many, many words. In fact, relative to most languages, other than a language like Mandarin, English has more words. So, for example, if you're thinking of um, Spanish or French, English has an enormous number of words, mostly because of its historical roots in two different languages, German and French. But what this means is, if English has a lot of words, there's no way we can teach all of them. So, one of the things that becomes really important is getting kids involved with texts. Now, this might seem kind of like a um, cyclical or tautological kind of argument, right? Hard words characterize complex text, and yet we need to get kids involved in reading text. Well, one of the things that I'm going to talk about in just a little bit is that a very small words in English account for most of the words in text. And unless you read a lot, you don't get very good at those words. Most American kids can read. They can recognize, if, if reading is recognizing words, but they're very slow at it. So I want to tell you a story about these three people who are in different classes in the same school. They're fourth graders. So here's a story about Abby and Alice and Alex. So if we give students a penny for every 500 words they read, this is what it looks like after the first day of school. It doesn't look that much different. Abby's got a couple, two more pennies than the rest of them. But as you see, after one week, the pennies are beginning to add up. But it's after a year that we can really see some differences. But where the differences are really critical are in the quarters. Okay, the quarters, each of those quarters represent rare words that students have encountered. And as you see here, the student on the right-hand side actually has a substantial number, 2,500 rare words versus 1,000. So keep thinking about how this goes along year after year. Now, it turns out that these students are in the same classroom, excuse me, in different classrooms in the same school. And it turns out that, well, these three students just come from a picture that I was able to get with permission on the internet. The story behind these three students is actually a real one. So when we look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, if 
the assessment that provides the model for our state tests at this point. We see that students who read just a little bit more, it actually turns out that the student on the right hand side is reading about seven minutes, uh, excuse me, four minutes more than the student in the middle and the student in the middle is reading about three and a half, four minutes more than the student on the left hand side. This reading actually correlates to how students do on a reading comprehension as assessment with open-ended response. A lot of them are open-ended responses. On the NAEP, about 60% of them are. Okay, so when we read, this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? To get good at something, we need to do it. And it's difficult to read complex text if we haven't read a whole lot of a variety of texts over time. So I'm going to give you three ideas today about increasing the amount of exposure to words that students have in your classrooms. And what I'm going to do is for each of these ideas, I'm going to give you an open access resource to help make that happen. Okay, so at Text Project, what we do is we provide open access resources. That means everything is for free. And I want to show you how some of these ideas really involve small steps in terms of a curriculum, but they can make a huge difference. So the first idea is that a very small group of words in English does the heavy lifting. And students need to be able to recognize these automatically. Now, we often think of these words as being the Dolch words, but this goes much, much beyond the Dolch words. The Dolch words are about 1% of this group of core vocabulary. And here, remember I told you I'd tell you more about the yellow words. 90% of the words on the common core exemplars, K through college and career ready, I actually had those books scanned. We took samples of them and established how well the core vocabulary accounted for that vocabulary in the, in the uh, exemplars. And it turns out that the percentage is a little higher in K through 3, but even up to college and career ready, we see that a large percentage, sometimes in informational text at the high school and college level, it might be 87, 88 percent. But this small group of 2,500 complex word families, and by a word family, I mean words like helpful, unhelpful, helpless, helping. Those 2,500 complex word families are really important in the words we read. Now, these aren't just easy words. I'm going to show you some examples of the words in just a minute. But I want to point out that these words often take on lots of different roles in text. They're frequent because these are often very versatile roles, uh, versatile roles that these words take on. Okay, then we have another percent of words in text, about 10 percent, that come from a huge number of word families. We can't teach all of these words. I'm going to give you some ideas in just a little bit for how we can help kids be strategic around the 10 percent. But first of all, I want to talk about the 90 percent. Because one of the things that we find when we talk to kids, when we ask them to read to us, when we study their performances, is that a big chunk of them, up to about 50 percent, of students at fourth and fifth grade are actually pretty rusty with this 2,500 complex word families. Now, as I said, the words go much beyond the Dolch words. Yes, the Dolch words are in there, but so too are words like power and words like answer. And keep remembering a word like answer can take on different uh, parts of speech, right? And a word like power can mean something very different in mathematics than it can mean in social studies or even in science. So these are words, and, and when I'm talking about these words, remember that I'm talking about the whole family of words. So it's not just discovery, but it would also be the word discoverer and discover. These are really important words. How do we get kids better at them? It is not about getting a word list and having kids memorize the words. Why? 
because these words can take on different meanings. They can take on different parts of speech. So what we want to do, and I'm just showing you here some examples from the um, um, seventh, sixth to eighth grade uh, books in the um, Common Core. What I'm showing you here is that these yellow words are prominent. Remember, about 10% of the other words come from uh, that large group of purple words, and those words can change a lot. There are also a lot of names in that group. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that our students have versatility with these 2,500 complex word families so that they can attend to the rare vocabulary. So if you're still trying to figure out or uh, approach the complex word families as if these are words to be recognized, you're really in trouble as you keep moving through the staircase of text complexity across the grades. So one of the things we really need to think about as texts have gotten harder over the last decade, and that was a movement that we saw about even 20 years ago in first grade texts, second grade texts, as we went to more authentic literature and guided reading books, we've had a tendency as teachers to really help kids out by often reading things aloud for them. And while there's a really critical role to read alouds in terms of expanding kids' exposure in terms of literature, we also want to remember that to become good at anything, you actually have to do it on your own. And it's not just following along with more proficient readers. It actually turns out that kids who spend a lot of their time following along with an audio reader or a more proficient adult or proficient peer actually let those people take the risks with new words. So we've got to think about increasing the volume of reading. And the volume of reading, as I showed you in those first three slides, they weren't huge numbers. So I'm not saying like you've got to make sure kids are reading an hour or two a day in, in the classroom. The difference between Abby, Alex, <clears throat> and um, um, Alice was from about seven minutes a day to about 15 minutes with the most proficient students. So what I'm suggesting is even that seven or eight minute difference makes a huge difference in terms of kids having responsibilities for reading. Now at Text Project, I've created a set of texts, all available for free download. There are about a hundred of them. And these texts have been written so that they have a higher than average percentage of the 2,500 complex word families. And the little number up there actually tells you the percentage of words that fall outside the 2,500. So most of these words like eggs and folds and skin and belly and rest and feet and warm and cold, these are words from the 2,500 families. There are some other words like penguins and awk, but the majority of the words here come from the 2,500 words. And feel free to use these extensively in your classroom. These texts help you get background knowledge while at the same time you're developing facility automaticity with the 2,500 word families. In this series, every volume that has a higher number means that there's, um, that's the percentage of words that fall beyond the um, 2,500 word families. But these texts provide kids with support on background knowledge. And we're going to have a little something to say about that in just a little bit. So there are texts that we've written to be compelling to students, help them with a core vocabulary. And these aren't intended, are not intended for teachers to be reading aloud to students. They're intended for students to read on their own. Some kids have really shoddy um, habits, and lots of the kids in the middle grades and middle school do in terms of having had other people, you know, we've outsourced reading with a teacher often doing a lot of the reading for kids. If that's the case in your classroom, chunk it up. Have kids read section of, sections of the text with a compelling question. What we find when we study poor readers is that they can read the first paragraph, but they get tired because it's a tedious process or they just have had enough. 
So what we want to do is teach them that in fact they can do this and to teach them to read longer and longer portions of text. Another place to get open access text is um, a website that I know many of you are acquainted with. They have at least, and I made this slide a little while ago, it, has, it says here 1,500 free passages from um, grades one to high school. Now it's actually several thousand. So take a look at those texts. Again, open access. So the first idea in terms of ensuring that our kids can and want to read complex texts and helping them with the vocabulary is remembering that to get good at reading, you need to do a lot of it. And it's not just saying, go and read this at home. For kids who haven't developed a habit of reading, if it's not happening in the classroom, and again, remember I'm saying about 50 minutes in a reading period is going to do the trick. Even seven additional minutes, there's additional research. I was participating in the seven minute challenge a couple of years ago. We saw that even a small amount makes a huge difference. And we have some new research from a program that I've been working on, ILIT, that shows just remarkable increases in students' comprehension on standardized norm reference tests when their reading increases substantially. Okay, the second idea, I, I just want to reiterate that it's not about memorizing lists. Words take on lots of different meanings. And the best way to do that is in the context of sentences in and from text, not memorizing uh, definitions, because these definitions change with nuances in the text. So I want to talk now about the purple words. And what I'm going to suggest is that these purple words, you don't have to treat them like 88,000 families that kids need to learn. It turns out these words occur in networks. And this is where the how words work part comes in. We want to teach kids networks of words. So rather than that old pattern of, you know, five to eight words that kids are learning a week, we're learning five to eight or maybe even more concepts. We're teaching words in relation to other words. And that's how you begin eating into that huge number of words that I designated as the purple or rare words. So remember, <clears throat> We've got these 2,500 complex word families. We've got words like energy and force that occur both in content area text and in narrative or literary text. These words can take on different meanings in those two kinds of text. Not all words do, you know, like a word like, but many do, a word like form or um, a word like, even a word like text takes on lots of different meanings today, doesn't it? Okay, but what I want to suggest is the unique words, the 10% that are unique to literary and content area text, those words live in different kinds of networks in stories and in content area text. So here's a good example. So here's another excerpt from um, the Birch Bark House. And when we see the word preoccupied, we're not anticipating that the word gash is going to be here or that the word um, hogged is going to be there. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. These are different words that develop a notion about a character in this text. But, you know, um, selfishly hogging attention is referring to the little brother. Preoccupied is with mother. So there are lots of different ways in which we express basic ideas and stories. In informational text, on the other hand, when we see a word having to do with embryo, we would anticipate that the word fertilize might be there. The word miniature kind of fits in with that, doesn't it? And we would expect that we'd see some kind of a species described when we're actually talking about this process. There are connections across the words in informational text that are different than the connections across words in literary text. So let's take a look here at some literary text. So here's 
an excerpt from The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And here you see words like, oh, keep remembering that this is not like the old Dick and Jane books where the same word was just repeated over and over and over again. Those books might have served a purpose for helping kids enter into reading, but they weren't high quality literature. In a piece of high quality literature, an author doesn't express the word fun over and over and over again. The author uses words like dazzled or brilliant or sparkling or glittered. Okay? There are synonyms for an idea. So the author doesn't say they were sparkling, you know, they were at first um, dazzled by the sparkling nature of the city and then sparkling emeralds and they were sparkling in the sun. There's variety. They create nuances with a group of words from a palette of words. Now, it's here's another example where we see disapproval, displeased, rage. Not the same word over and over again, but what you're getting is a kind of mood. And what I'm going to propose to you today is that these are the words in the stories. And when we're teaching those words, we want to teach them in connection to each other. So this is a concept that the writer is creating. But we also want to show students that the author had other words that could have been chosen, but that these words were chosen for a particular purpose. Let's take words like hypnotized and awe and use it instead of dazzled to see what kind of effect that would have. This is an idea that's very applicable to students' writing. The words in literary text typically have to do with concepts that students are aware of and even sometimes highly familiar with. They're familiar with the idea of things sparkling. But what they don't know are these particular words. So what we want to do is we want to create awareness of a network of these words. Okay, here's another example from the story um, of, with Cato with agitated, indignant, angrily raged. Here are some, now, in looking at these words, when I'm talking about synonyms, I'm not saying they mean exactly the same. They have nuanced meanings, and that's why the author chose those words so carefully. So we want to teach kids that authors make careful choices, that they expand the notion. You're starting to see how angry or full of rage, you know, the character moves from being agitated and indignant to being full of rage, how that changes in this story. And the author is using a range of words to express those ideas. Now, how do we help students actually develop this network of words? And I'm suggesting that this is something that we can teach and uncover for students. So when they approach a text, they should be aware that in any complex text, there are going to be words that you haven't encountered before. In stories, authors typically use these words to communicate about a character's internal processes and decisions, their emotions, their movements, and their traits. And I've actually identified here 20 words that go a long way to accounting for many synonyms in the text that students are reading, especially in the elementary school and even into the middle school. When the author tells you about the emotions, these movements, traits, the author is giving you insight into the character. When they tell you about, you know, if a character is planning versus scheming, that's really critical information. And I'm saying these 20 basic concepts are ones that most students have some familiarity with. And what we want to do is use their knowledge of the familiar words to keep building out those networks. And what we've done at Text Project is we've actually created a set of lessons. So for each of those words that I just showed you, we've got a set of lessons. Now, this is oriented for you as a teacher. We're not suggesting that kids are copying all this or be given this, but we're teaching kids that the word guess can have several different meanings. 
It's also used in common phrases, and it's also used in various ways idiomatically, or there are words used around it idiomatically. And always, we want to build on the knowledge of our Spanish-speaking kids, and for those who don't speak Spanish, we want to give the connection to academic language. Okay, so we've provided a set of these lessons, as I said, for every one of the words on this list. And what I'm saying is, even kids who are in linguistically fairly sparse environments or communities, they know about being glad and sad and mad and selfish and fear. Okay, what they don't know are some of the words that kind of move into academic and literary language. And we can use their knowledge of these fundamental words to keep expanding their understandings. Now for every one of those lessons, we also have a form that students can fill out. And again, you can make choices at different grade levels how expanded those forms are going to be. Now, when it comes to informational text, as we saw with embryo and fertilized and miniature, those words aren't synonyms for each other. They are related concepts. So what I've got here is the pink words are the nodes of the ideas. Okay, And these words actually build on one another in definitions. So to understand properties, it helps you, you will at times use the word dissolve to explain some of the properties of words. And as you learn more about dissolving, you learn more about properties, you also learn more about substances. substances. And as I learn more about abrasive, I learn more about property and so on and so forth. These words are connected to each other, they're not synonyms. And yes, I'm actually suggesting that students develop a habit and that you as teachers develop a habit of developing these topical networks. I think starting in second and third grade, kids should have notebooks or a place on their um, Chromes or, or um, note, uh, digital notebooks where they've actually stored networks of words. What I'm saying is it's important for us to see how these words fit together. That's why I'm just really perplexed when science teachers or social studies teachers send out lists of words for kids to know. What they need to do is to put them into networks where they see how the words are connected to each other and how they interact with each other. This is a whole system that helps you understand these ideas. So here's an example of some text on world wonders um, having to do with architecture and archaeology. And what we want to do then is to take those words and, and by the way, there are absolutely no right answers here. But we want to show how the words, the ideas, the concepts, remember words represent concepts. Okay, it's not just learning the vocabulary. It's learning what is part of architecture and how architecture differs in the ancient Middle Ages and modern times. It's understanding what some of the challenges are in maintaining monuments. So these are concepts that we want to help students develop. And as you see here, <clears throat> I'm always wanting to show students how the academic language the romance level of our language that is very uh, highly connected to Spanish, how that can help us expand our vocabularies and understand how words work. So my second idea is that rare words live in networks. And those networks are conceptual for both literary and informational texts, but they're, they're different in terms of what the unit is. So we're developing ideas around com communication, around emotions, traits, and so forth in literary text. In informational text, there are concepts having to do with chemical mixtures, for example, or architecture and engineering, 
that we want to develop and we want to remember. Okay, the third idea, and this is my last idea, is that what we're talking about when we talk about vocabulary is knowledge. Okay? We're not just talking about individual little words that pop out here and there. What we're doing is developing knowledge. And the thing is that knowledge is stored in text. Yes, I realize you can get a lot of knowledge from videos. There's also a lot of videos that where, where there's not a whole knowledge, knowledge a lot of knowledge to be gotten, like some of the cat videos, but, and that would just be my opinion, but what I'm emphasizing here is that movies, videos, in the main, have actually been based on some text. There were scripts, there were ideas written down. And it turns out that when we write things down, texts have more rare words than conversations. So to expand our knowledge, and we are in a knowledge age. The commodity of the 21st century is knowledge. Those who know are going to be able to reap from the largesse of the century. Those who don't have specialized and unique knowledge or don't know even having a breadth and depth of different knowledge, they're going to really be the ones who struggle. And texts are the place. We've never had access to texts like we do. Even conversations between college adults, as we see here in parents picking up their kids from school, aren't as rich as most um, picture books that parents read to their toddlers at night. Text is where we store knowledge. And in fact, what we know and how we comprehend is very closely connected. This is kind of an issue, right? Because we've been told in, in some of the work on close reading um, to use the text as the source and not confound it with our background knowledge. That's really not quite possible. I think what we're really talking about in terms of close reading is not developing or telling kids everything that happens in the text or wandering really far from the text. To be able to comprehend, you need to know things. And what I'm suggesting here is that Background knowledge comes from text. Now, if I don't know a lot about a particular topic, don't despair. People who have breadth and depth of knowledge in some topics actually do better when they get to new topics. You know how to learn things. And I want to point out that in the National Assessment of Educational Progress, that's really um, important in terms of the public legislators, and also um, allocation of funds in describing who our kids are as readers, what you see in English language arts isn't a prescribed knowledge curriculum in English language arts, but we see a range of topics. So our kids need to know how to know about new knowledge as they get to different kinds of texts. That's one of the reasons we want to do a lot of magazine reading. Uh, but as you see in these examples um, from the fourth grade National Assessment of Educational Progress, there are different sets of ideas on any topic you'll encounter in most ELA assessments and in most texts. What we have to do is prepare our students for this rare vocabulary and, as we've talked about earlier, getting good at the vocabulary, at the words that occur a lot. So how can we develop bodies of knowledge in English language arts? I'm just saying that needs to be a foundation or a, an assumption, one of our guiding principles in English language arts instruction. Well, I've talked about one thing, and that is these knowledge maps. And what I'm suggesting here is that kids and classrooms are collecting these and adding on to them as we read on different topics. Okay, so that's one of the things. We also want to have topics of magazine articles and texts that kids can explore. For example, here is a set of texts on architecture from the ReadWorks site. And what I'm proposing here is that among these different topics, excuse me, different um, pieces on the topic of architecture, 
we can have students select from among these and become the person who, in a discussion, brings the point of view from that article. Now, I've heard that some kids in some classes, you know, choice makes an awful lot of difference for kids, especially in the middle grades and middle school. It's not choosing whether you can read or not. I'm saying you choose among some topics, or excuse me, among some selections. So the point here isn't um, that I'm, we're all going to find the one that's the, the, um, the shortest, so I don't have to read a whole lot. We're going to say certain kids are going to read Article 1, some are going to choose to read Article 2. Oh, we've got enough kids reading Article 2 now, so we've got three and four left. Okay, so kids actually have some authentic reasons to share information. That's another element along with choice that really contributes to student engagement. And finally, especially when we've got English language learners, but I think this is useful for all kids, I think that pictures can really help to develop concepts. One of the things that we've done at Text Project is we've put together these sets of slides on a variety of topics. I'm showing you fashion and design today. But what we've done is we've organized the topics within a larger topics, and we've provided a set of pictures. So here are general and specific fashion and design terms. Okay? And we've provided some really interesting pictures that can help kids understand what these notions are. This can be really useful for students who don't speak English, but who have these ideas, they just don't have the English words for them. Or for kids who are needing to expand their vocabularies. Having something concrete is a very good way to learn and to remember. Okay, so here are some more ideas. And as you see here, we've actually used the words in the context of sentences, not all the times, but some of the time. Um, we've also got, so we've got a whole group of these um, word pictures, including on topics like ancient Egypt. So I really welcome you to use these. What I've said then <clears throat> is that vocabulary is all about developing knowledge. And one of the most critical things that characterizes an effective reading program is the presence of an opportunity to learn something. Kids want to learn things. And what we want to do is we want to develop, be systematic in developing bodies of knowledge in ELA classrooms. And I've suggested word pictures and connected sets of texts as well as word maps, which I'd already talked about. So these are my three ideas for how we can prepare students to be equipped with abundant vocabularies, but also with strategies so that they can learn new words and texts. Okay, we want them to be really good and facile with that, those 2,500 words in English. We also want them to be strategic and to develop rudimentary networks of words that fall into the rare words. And finally, what this thing about reading is all about, it's about learning things. We want kids to understand text as a source of knowledge and to develop areas in which they become experts and, and as well as developing some breadth of their knowledge. I welcome you to join us at Text Project. Um, one of the things that I've been doing in the last year and a half is I've been writing a series of books on where words come from. Um, sometimes we call this etymology. But I um, have been writing a book about every two or three months, along with a co-author, um, some, se some set of co-authors. And I think that they're really compelling stories about how different languages have influenced English, like Native American languages. You know, almost half of the American states have names that come from Native lang uh, American languages. Where words for food come from? You know, some cultures we call it pasta, some we call noodles. Why is that, and what are the sources for those words? Um, we give these books away to people who join us 
on our mailing list, and we send out only one newsletter a month, 